what does it take to become a Navy SEAL? Run to the sound of gunfire. You don't know what somebody's made of until they step into that training. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. The, the training is designed to make sure that everyone fails. And my ego couldn't take it. MBA programs don't do a great job of producing leaders because the enemy gets a vote, much like your competition gets a vote. <laughs> Enterprise is the basis of our democracy. America, that's pretty damn awesome. Thank you. Mike Sorelli is an ex-Navy SEAL. George Randall is an ex-U.S. Army officer. Together, they are on a mission to take on one of today's most critical issues in the workplace, the assessment, selection, development, and deployment of talent. Drawing on decades of experience in the Special Forces and working with elite organizations, they outline the problem in their new book, The Talent War. They say that many organizations are already losing this war and as a result, they are not only losing their best people, but losing competitive advantage, market share, and ultimately are in danger of going out of business. But they also say there is a solution for those who are willing to listen. Hello and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast on this first episode of 2021. I am joined today by an incredible American, Mike Sorelli, who is co-author of the book, The Talent War. And we're recording at a very interesting time in our nation's history because as of this recording, just three days ago, protesters stormed the Capitol building here in Washington, D.C. And if this week has taught us anything, it's that freedom isn't free and requires daily vigilance and fighting. And we have to fight for the Republic every day. And Mike, you have been a part of that fight and you and your colleagues and brethren have, been, have borne the burden of that fight for over 245 years. And before we get into the interview, I, I just want to take a moment to thank you for your service. Dude, Mark, thank you. Happy to be here uh, and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And, and while we're on the topic, I, I just want to ask you, as somebody who has fought to preserve our nation's freedoms, what do you think about what's transpired this week? Mark, let me, let me start off by saying when you're in the military, you are forced to be apolitical. And what I mean by that is, do we have our political opinions? each military member? Absolutely. But regardless of whoever our commander in chief is and, and whatever party they come from, whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, that's our commander in chief. And guess what? We're going to support our boss, whether we agree with their domestic or international policy. That said, 2020, we're seeing a horrible display uh, of leadership where we expect our leadership to be the best. We get the exact opposite. The leadership we're seeing from our political uh, electees is at an all-time low. First off, storming the Capitol was totally unacceptable. Even though the left has been in the streets rioting with Antifa for the last few months of 2020, even if this was one day, it doesn't matter. It's like the idiots are coming out from both sides and we need to put them onto the, uh, the sidelines. The adults need to come together with, with a sense of civility and right. talk about these issues and come up with real solutions. The fact that we keep electing the same people into office we have nobody else to blame but ourselves. People that have refused to work with the other side of the aisle, that is demoralizing. For a lot of military guys, we're, we're almost numb to this, but we're, we're like the blinking man emoji, just sitting on the sidelines. Just like, are you, are you all kidding me? Do we need to come in there and slap you guys around to, 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 to get you to work together? Here, here's the problem, and, and this will boil it up. People now walk down the street and say, oh, that guy must be a Democrat or, oh, that, that, that guy must be a right wing uh, Republican rather than saying, hey, that's an American. People are looking for differences to pull people apart rather than saying, hey, what are the commonalities? Right. We're all Americans. We need to come together and figure out how we're going to solve whatever issues on the table in a very civil and effective manner and then move on for the greater good of this country and for the next generation behind us. God, the millennials and Gen Z, they just must be waiting for us to get out of the way. To, uh, to step in and actually uh, lead with some diplomacy. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. So I want to get into your background and I want to get into the book as well. I want to first talk about your special operations experience because I think that context is going to inform what we're going to talk about in your book, The Talent War. 
What does it take to become a Navy SEAL? It, so first off, a Barkley tell I, I, I look like a bum sitting on the couch uh, to the audience. I, I just had a hip replacement. So, um, <laughs> hey, life goes on. Uh, I, I was not happy to, uh, no, to join no, you. No yeah. worries. What does it take to become a Navy SEAL? And most people get this wrong because, hey, let's be honest, there, there's 1% of our population that now serves in the military. And the 99%, to use a harsh word here, are ignorant uh, of what the military really stands for, what it, what it involves. Mm-hmm. And usually their perception of the military uh, – comes from uh, Warner Brothers or whatever other movie studio uh, does a movie on the military, doesn't do the, the military justice. So what does it take to become a Navy SEAL? It takes a whole lot of heart. It takes a whole lot of drive and it takes a whole lot of resiliency. And naturally, even when I went into BUDS, remember I, w- I was in Marine Special Operations uh, before I went to uh, SEAL training. So I, I really had a lot of experience prior to, to trying out for the SEALs. As you come in, you look at the big football player from Florida State, no kidding, uh, who, who's the starting fullback and you're like, oh man, that guy's going to make it. He's a stud, double days, heat, uh, like that guy's going to make it. And then he's the first one to quit. And then the little guy who did speech and debate, fresh out of high school, did speech and debate and weighs 140 pounds. You're like, oh, that nerd is going to quit. He's going to be one of the first ones to go. And at the wow. end of Hell Week, as you look down the line, there he is with just this stone cold look on his face. You don't know what somebody's made of until they step into that training. The reason I switched from the Marine Corps to the SEALs is everyone always would look at the SEALs and say, hey, they actually went through the world's toughest military training. And my ego couldn't take that. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm a recon Marine. I was proud. I love the the Marine reconnaissance community, which eventually became uh, something called MARSOC, which they're referred to as the uh, the Raiders, a bunch of bad badasses as well as the Army Green Berets and the rest of the special operations community. But the training is designed, and this goes back to the hiring process, not to put these, these young men and women through hell just for you know our pleasure as instructors, Navy SEAL instructors. Though we, we do have a laugh when they're cold, wet, and sandy getting slammed by the, uh, the surf in San Diego. It's actually designed to push people to their mental and physical limits because that's when true character emerges. So if you and I are in a safe space, air conditioned, and I'm trying to apply the pressure, I can only push you so far outside your comfort zone. But when you are shivering near hypothermia, when I've been making you run for 24 hours straight. When, when you're exhausted, I start to see who Mark truly is. Yeah. And that's where it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter about your physicality. It matters about your heart. And again, the training's designed to knock people down again and again. And for some people, they've never really failed before they got into butts. They were the all-star athlete. They got a 4.0. Things just, you know, I'm not saying they didn't work, but things came easier to them. They were, they, they had natural talent. And then for the first time in buds, the instructors pushed them down and they're like, oh, this is easy. They get back up and guess what they do? They push them down again and again and again. And for some people, they can't take the fact that they fail, fail, fail. That's the training's going to make you fail. Everyone fails in butts. And that Olympic athlete who's, who's a medalist in the Olympics starts to experience failure in a repetitive, successive manner for the first time in their life. And guess what? Literally within hours, it can crack their foundation and they, they end up ringing that bell and quitting. It, it is an interesting process. And it, it, you know, I call special operations, regardless of what community you go into, the Green Berets, MARSOC, SEALs, Air Force Special Operations, the assessment and selection, their hiring process is the most robust behavioral interview in the world that no company can replicate. Even though the training can be anywhere from six months to two years, they still get it wrong from time to time. They let somebody through who in the interview process demonstrated what they wanted to see. But once they become a SEAL or once become a 75th Ranger Regiment Ranger, they start demonstrating behaviors that were not consistent with what we saw in the assessment and selection. Wow, that's intense. So if I hear you correctly, SEAL training is basically an exercise in failure, like repeated, repeated failure. Like, so it's not a matter, it's really it, like to be successful, you have to go through a, a series of successive failures. The, the training is designed to make sure that everyone fails. Because I've been telling you on the battlefield, things will go wildly wrong. You're going to go in with a plan. There are so many things that the business world misses out on that they can learn from the military. How often I hear, and it's so disheartening because I come from Silicon Valley. My dad started a marketing and advertising agency. He came from nothing. Uh, he started an advertising and mar- marketing agency in Silicon Valley. I was always surrounded by these, these tech uh, moguls, amazing business leaders. They always had a deep respect for the military. But I, you know, as I tra- travel to the United States, I, ha- I hear business leaders sort of denigrate the military and their style of leadership. They're like, hey, 
military leadership doesn't work in the business world. I'm like, leadership is leadership is leadership. What are you talking about? The business world can learn so much from the military, especially how we plan. We run training where it's just planning. We never go execute the mission. We just want to see how they would plan for a mission. And wow. we'll, we'll run them through planning scenarios, planning scenarios, and they never step onto the training field and actually execute those, you know, and we mix it up. But our military members have to be very good at planning. And before we ever step onto the battlefield, we are very good. We make sure we do our due diligence. We make sure we're going into a plan. We make sure that we're accounting for potential contingencies mm -hmm. that could happen, either environmental or the enemy, because the enemy gets a vote, much like your competition gets a vote <laughs> in how you bring a product or a service to market. And the customer also gets a vote. So we mitigate our risk to the lowest level. And even then, things can go wildly wrong. And when something goes wrong, it's not one thing. It's like 10 things all at once. Mm -hmm. It's Murphy's Law. And when you're getting shot at, when one of your fellow Americans is wounded in the street, when your guys are scattered because they sought cover and you can't communicate, you, you don't know if you have a good head count everyone uh, within your element, it can play on your psyche. And a lot of humans would quit in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that even though, you know, as we're pushing these, these SEAL candidates through training, we, we need to make it look as like, as if there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Like th there's just no good outcome from this situation. We want to see if they can drive through that. If there's no quit a and resiliency and drive are, are two of the key things we look for uh, in training, as well as team ability. And what I mean by team ability is teamwork. Is this person a team player. There is no industry or sport out there that doesn't require somebody to be a great team player. Mm -hmm. And if you have a company uh, of individuals, I guarantee you're a company of individuals that are going to fail. So I want to get into the book. Um, why did you and George write The Talent War? So George, as per your intro, was a former Army Mustang. I was a Mustang as well. What that means is we serve both as an enlisted member mm -hmm. and then the, the military this is how awesome the military, they sent us both to college to get our degrees and then we became officers. The, the biggest, again, America probably doesn't know this, the biggest provider of scholarships in the nation is the U.S. Army. We put a precedence on education, on learning. But George has over 20 years of talent acquisition executive search experience in a, uh, a variety of different domains from hedge funds to tech to cybersecurity. He's very good at what he does and he's frustrated with the system. So George is unlike many HR executives in the world. He's very aggressive. When I say very aggressive, not aggressive towards people. Right. He's very aggressive and very passionate about building the very best teams for whatever organization he works for and then developing them and retaining them. And myself coming from the special operations community, I was always fascinated with building teams. And we combine that out of a frustration of what we see in the business world, that a lot of businesses are just missing the importance of the true strategic function of HR. HR is designed to be a strategic function for organizations, yet most de-emphasize it. Most, based off the structure of their organization, really place HR as like a, a secondary or tertiary function. It's a cost center. It's, it's not a revenue driver. Oh, no. HR is a revenue generator. It's the funnel that feeds each of your revenue generating uh, functions like sales or marketing or anything else. George and I thought we could write this in a way that small to medium businesses could pick up the book and say, hey, let's have a conversation about how we're approaching talent. If a company picks up the book and has a conversation about talent, we consider the book a win. So we've gotten a lot of great feedback from the book more than we anticipated because we're two small guys. Like nobody knows who George Randall and Mike Sorelli is, and that's fine. We're not out for fame. But if we can help just a few American companies, which are the backbone of the American economy, these small to, to medium businesses, which also means if they keep the economy strong, we have a strong military, then we consider it a victory. I heard you and George say one time that the greatest force in the world is actually not the U.S. military, but the U.S. economy. Tell me a little bit more about that, because that dovetails nicely with what you just said. So, hey, the U.S. military, when we say that, don't think we're not giving uh, the due that the U.S. military uh, <laughs> deserves. <laughs> I mean, look at it this way. The, the two stories. Right after 9-11, we dropped in a few hundred special operations soldiers, mainly the, the Army Green Berets that operate in 12-man teams. Mm -hmm. And these few hundred American special operators went against an estimated force Estimates were like 50 to 75,000 Taliban and Al Qaeda members. These special operations soldiers built relationships in a matter of days with these friendly Afghans that didn't like Taliban or Al Qaeda, quickly trained them, organized them, and then brought the fight to Al Qaeda and pushed them into Pakistan. That's the might of the US military. And then you saw to a great, grander scale 
the U.S. military go against the fifth largest army at the time, Saddam's army, and defeat them in three and a half weeks. We're pretty damn good. The military <laughs> has won every battle that our politicians have tasked us. Now, the wars ended up different because of bad uh, international policy. Um, so, shock and awe, the military can do it very well. And when you watch it, it's pretty damn impressive. But at the end of the day, what grants our country the latitude to influence the rest uh, international policy is our economy. And you always have to remember that. Much of the American Revolution was based off the fact that we wanted, people just wanted to engage in free enterprise, free of the king and taxation uh, to a very uh, bad degree. Enterprise is the basis of our democracy. And people think, well, that's evil. It's people. No, it is people. People run free, free enterprise. But you know what excites you when you leave the military is that most of us that served 20 years spent the majority of our young adult lives defending free enterprise. And when we get out, stand by, like veterans are excited. It's our opportunity to engage in it. Not, I'm no longer limited by a military salary. I can now create a company that becomes a multi-million dollar company and then gives back to the very system that gave to me when I served. And that's when you think about it and step back, you're like, America, that's pretty damn awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So what's so special about the special operations forces in terms of how they identify talent, assess, select, develop, you know, tell us, give, give us a little bit of background and context on that as a launching point for the concepts that you highlight in the book. Absolutely. It comes down to the process that they've, they've designed. We call it assessment and selection. You assess people and then you select the right ones into your organization. For the business world, Assessment and selection means hiring process. Because we've designed this behavioral assessment and selection process, we have become very good at selecting people based off their potential, not their industry experience. We've had investment, like we've had Harvard educated investment bankers yeah. come try out for the SEALs, and we're like, ah, uh, nah. Yeah. They, they don't have the, the character and attributes we're looking for. But then we also do have some Harvard investment, you know, educated investment bankers make it through. So industry experience doesn't matter. We want to see if you have the character attributes we're looking for. So special operations, the Green Beret community, the SEAL community, the MARSOC community, the Air Force uh, special operations community has codified what they're looking for. They all have a list of these attributes and the, the training is then designed much like an interview question or an interview process is designed to elicit and identify certain behaviors. And so we know what we're looking for. And guys, this special operations assessment and selection process, which we sort of initially took from uh, mainly the British, have been doing this for a long time, as well, well as uh, pre-World War II uh, Germany and how they selected certain uh, leaders into military positions. We've taken that and then honed it over the last half century. Hmm. And this process is still evolving. I guarantee you, I know it's Saturday uh, morning, very early, yesterday, there were some green berets sitting around the table leading training or SEALs sitting around leading training talking about how they need to evolve the assessment and selection process. They're wow. continually looking at their hiring process and asking, is it still effective? What is the efficacy of this process? Or is it relevant to what we need in our operators five years from now? So the fact that they keep innovating and adapting that process is what keeps them selecting top talent into the organization. So it comes down to your process. But before you design the process, you have to know what the hell you're looking for. And then where companies get it wrong is they, say, you know, they grab these nine uh, attributes that, that we listed out in the book and they're like, hey, we're going to look for all nine. No. Okay, there's some attributes that are, you can call the core values of the organization, like integrity. Integrity is not negotiable. That's a core value of our organization. But each function in your organization is, is going to require somebody with different attributes. Somebody in marketing is going to look very different than a high performer in, in, in an engineering department or R&D yeah. or sales. Each of those people, the high performers, have a different set of attributes that drive them. So there, there may be some parallels. There definitely are. But you need to know what you're looking for in right. each of those roles. And that comes down to what we call creating talent profiles. You know, look at it this way. In special operations assessment selection, we know what we're looking for in the enlisted personnel going through the training. We also know what we're looking for in the officers. Mm -hmm. And while an officer may have all the uh, attributes uh, as an enlisted member, if they lack the ones that we're looking for on the officer side, they're not going to make it through the training. 
Same with the enlisted guys. And one of the things that was really surprising to me as I was reading the book and listening to other interviews that you've given is that you're targeting a fairly young audience, like where the, where the, the business world is really looking for the resume. They're looking for experience. They're looking for industry knowledge and experience. You're looking at like high school kids. Is high school that, and college graduates. High school and college. Yes. Yeah, it's fairly young, like without, without industry experience, you know. It right? doesn't exist. If I went to my old high school in San Jose, uh, which was an all boys school, Jesuit, you know, parochial school, and looked at the, uh, the 1500 and said, hey, all of you, we're recruiting for the Navy SEALs today. If you have prior special operations uh, experience, raise your hand. All 1,500 would be like scratching their head. What, what does he mean? It doesn't exist. Experience tells you where somebody's been. Mindset and character tell you where they're going. Yeah. And trust me, we're not discounting experience. Experience matters. Mm. If someone utilized that experience in a manner to grow, if somebody has a growth mindset and they've, they've got all this experience under their belt, what we're looking for in that interview process is to see if they've taken the time to reflect and yeah. if they can demonstrate they've grown and that their performance has continually raised. Now, because special operations recruits without lack of industry experience by nature, we hire for potential. Why should it be any different in the business world? Just because somebody has 20 years of experience doesn't mean you should hire them over somebody that only has five. If that person with 20 years of experience is an exceptional human being with high character, with the attributes you want, absolutely hire them. But why do people default in the business world to things like industry experience, because those are what you call objective measures. So Mark, let me back up. Yeah. The default mode for human beings in life is laziness. What I mean by that is if humans have a choice between the path of least resistance and doing something the, the right way, they'll choose the path of least resistance. And when it comes to the hiring process and, and you've got a hundred resumes to look through and I'm like, oh, I've got Mark here with 20 years of experience in marketing. Mike Sorelli, fresh out of uh, college. Mike Sorelli's out of the pile and Mark's uh, still in. That's the easy thing to do. Yeah. People, you know, the easy thing to do, objective measures are, what was their GPA? What university did they go, mm -hmm. go to? How many years of industry experience do they have? Subjective things like evaluating somebody's character are difficult That's because awesome. that takes time to build. That capability to assess people based off character and attributes is a skill, a soft skill that requires time to build. And a lot of people in the hiring process don't have that. Yeah. And so hence they go with the easiest thing because they say, if this person with five years of industry experience doesn't work out, vice this young person, this young college graduate who has all the, the growth mindset, has all the character and attributes. If we hire this person with industry experience and it doesn't uh, work out, we can look at our bosses and say, hey, he or she had five years of experience. Well, you know, it was the smart hire, just didn't work out. You want to hire people with growth mindset. You want to hire people with character. Mm -hmm. Look at COVID. Yeah. COVID was the ultimate litmus test if your workforce was a workforce of character and attributes and resiliency, or if you just hired for industry experience and then COVID hit and those people quit at the first sign of chaos. Not physically quit, but just in terms of they didn't know how to deal with the pressure, they didn't know how to deal with that environment and they became ineffective. And you just talked about the growth mindset. In the book, you talk about the talent mindset. T tell us a little bit about what that is because that's a pretty key theme of your book. So you can tell pretty quickly whether an organization has a talent mindset or not. Mm. Special operations community has it in spades. The special operations has, you could equate it to their core values. They call them the special operations truths. These mm. are laws. These are known to be true. They're irrefutable. And each of the five laws are people are the most important thing in the world. Mm. People are the thing that defines success for your organization. So the talent mindset is a deep foundational belief that the greatest strategic competitive advantage any organization can ever hope to achieve and maintain is your level of talent. People are what commercialize products and services, not technology, not systems. And special operations understands this. They send a small force of 12 green berets against continually against a larger numerically superior force. And guess what? Those 12 green berets come out on top time and time again. How is that? Because quality of your people is more important than quantity. Mm -hmm. And so you can come into a company and, and recognize fairly quickly, one, how their HR is structured uh, by, by their, their people policies whether they have a talent mindset or not. One of the things that I'm curious about is, is this talent mindset scalable at a large level? 
like I can see it being easily scalable at say a small or mid-sized company level, but at a, at a, an enterprise company, hundreds of thousands of employees, is it scalable? Absolutely. How large, Mark, do you think the United States Special Operations Command is? How many personnel do you think fall under that command? I, I don't know. I would say maybe a few thousand. 50,000. 50,000? The last I saw was the U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command, also known as SOCOM, because we, oh. we've got to put an acronym on everything. That's right. what we do. <laughs> it's 50,000 people. Now, wow. that, that didn't happen overnight. That happened over a matter of decades. Trust me, when a war kicks off, the president and all the politicians and even senior generals who aren't and, and admirals who aren't part of special operations say, we need more Green Berets. We need more Navy SEALs now. And the SEAL and the Green Beret community and all special operations says, okay, understood. We're not deviating from our process. Mm -hmm. One of the truths I just talked about is special operations cannot be mass produced in, in wake of an emergency. Yeah. We're not going to deviate from our process. So how does that correlate to business? What is one of the best things for your business? What also can be wildly problematic? Growth. What do most business leaders do when all of a sudden you experience growth? They say, hey, we need 50 people now. And the HR says, okay, we'll start the process. And what do most business leaders do? They say, speed up the process. When you speed up that process, you start making bad hires. When you deviate from the process, if you have a good talent process, once you deviate from that, you start making bad hires and you dilute your culture. Special operations, right. push back and say no. Yeah. SEALs, it takes two years to create a SEAL. Guess what? We're not shortening that process. Mm -hmm. I know there's a war going on. We'll, we'll try to put more people into the pipeline and see if that produces more SEALs, which it doesn't. We've tried that. <laughs> the process remains the same. There's, there's an amazing organization. It's like the premier organization in the military. It's called Delta Force. Have you ever heard of, yeah, it, you know, the Chuck Norris movies. These guys are awesome. The founder of Delta Force, which you could consider him in the business world a disruptor. His name was Charlie Beckwith, Silver Star from Vietnam. You, you, you look at a picture of this guy and it's pretty scary. And he was the founder of Delta Force and came up with the concept. And he said, I'd rather go down the river with seven studs than a hundred shitheads. What he was saying is I would rather go into uh, a new market or into war with seven solid employees than a hundred people that are uh, of average performance. And so as companies grow, you have to be cautious. I know you've got all these purchase orders coming in, whatever it may be, do not deviate from your process. Look at the, the quality of people that you have and tell them that they're gonna have to work harder, that they're gonna have to hold the line until you can find people of equal performance to them to bring them onto the, uh, the team. So yes, you can scale this. Special Operations Command is, uh, is 50,000 people strong and it's taken decades to build that. Now are all 50,000 people solid performers? No, we do have weak performers amongst them. And much like Netflix, who believes that rock stars should be in every position, we'll remove them and we'll start the process of, again, finding their replacement, somebody who's extremely talented. What advice do you typically offer organizations in terms of attracting and keeping top talent? You can tell whether you're attracting top talent by the quality of the people coming into the funnel. And your whole goal is to become what we call a talent magnet. That's not new. Special operations is a talent magnet. If you went to the initial start of special forces assessment selection or SEAL training, and you looked at the 250 to 300 kids lined up, each of them are amazing human beings, amazing Americans. They had to score above a certain intelligence level. They had to have a certain level of fitness. If you listen to their stories, they're athletes, they're scholars. It's impressive. But out of that 300, the attrition rate is 80 to 90%. So we are attracting the right talent. We know that. One, it's Hollywood has really helped us out with all these movies and these books. But becoming a talent magnet takes time. What we say, George and I, what we came down to it, the ultimate litmus test to whether you're a talent magnet or not is actually how your current employees interact with the local populace or the public or even your alumni. Does one of your current employees at a cocktail party introduce themselves as, hey, how you doing? And people say, what do you do? Oh, thank you for asking. I'm an executive search consultant with EF Overwatch. We supply a different uh, level of talent to American companies. And they do it with pride. A good example of that on, on a grander scale is, have you ever met somebody that works for, from Google? They'll be like, I'm a Googler. Right. And they say it with pride. 
or okay. even people that are now CEOs of a company, maybe they're the head of a private equity firm and they worked, with, uh, worked for McKinsey in the past, they always find a way to work in, well, hey, I started with McKinsey. There's a sense of pride there for people that went to work with McKinsey. It's almost like part of their DNA. And if your current employees and your alumni are somehow tying your company into their personal fabric and introducing themselves that way, you know you've started to become a talent magnet. A lot of people don't do this well. A lot of companies are consumer facing and yes, you have to be that. But a lot of companies aren't telling the story of their employees. They don't have an employee value proposition. They're not putting their uh, employees on a video on LinkedIn saying, let me tell you why I love working for EF Overwatch. Let me tell you why I love working for Oracle. And you don't see that. If you make people a priority, your people will make your organization a priority. When your people make your organization a priority, you start to see a, a different level of performance enterprise wide. That's the goal. How would you advise leaders in changing their culture to be able to adopt this kind of talent mindset? So you've got to be very weary about how you build cultures. You have to be very intentional is what I've heard lately. And I really do like that. A good example is Netflix and their culture deck, if you've ever seen that. I mean, they call it out right from the start. They say, hey, we're not those flowery words on the wall, those core values that people love to paint on the wall of their lobby. And in fact, in the culture deck, they, they threw... So a few, uh, you know, attributes or, or core values like integrity, communication, service on their deck. And on the next slide, it says those were the same values that Enron had on the wall as you walked in. We all know how, what happened with Enron, one of the most unethical organizations. Extremely smart and intelligent people right. ran that organization, but they were highly unethical. So, you know, ultimately, we all want this culture. We all want to use those buzzwords. But that's not your culture unless you exhibit those behaviors in, in your day-to-day -day lifestyle. So as you create your culture and you define it, you've got to look in the mirror and say, is this truly who we are? Mm -hmm. If I say drive, am I demonstrating, demonstrating drive to the rest of my, my uh, subordinate leaders in my day-to-day -day behaviors? If I say integrity, am I make, making ethical decisions for the organization that my subordinate leaders can respect and understand, even if it seems like it's the unpopular decision. So culture matters. And ultimately, you know, the people that are interviewing for your company are going to look at your culture and they're going to try to, to, to judge, is this a person? Is this a boss who truly not only believes what they say, but actually demonstrates it? Or is this a, a boss who says, do as I say, not as I do? And if it's culture that says, do as we say, not as we do. We've got these, these values on the wall, but we don't demonstrate those on a daily basis. People will come into your organization. You'll become a revolving door of talent. They'll be like, whoa, this is a toxic culture. I'm out of here. You know, a lot of people tell people, hey, if you're going to take a job, stick, stick around for, for one year or two years because it'll look bad on your resume. Don't. If you step into an organization and it's unethical, it's a toxic culture, get out of there as quickly as possible because that's also months out of your life. Don't hesitate. If you work for an organization that doesn't execute what they preach, get out of there as quickly as possible. Or try to change the culture. If you can't change it, get out of there. Find a company that, that truly believes in what they say. A lot of the things that you're talking about are actually really counterintuitive in the business world. What are the consequences to organizations if they don't listen to the advice that you give them either in person or through your book? Even if you have breakthrough sales right now, you know, which Enron, an unethical organization, Volkswagen, an unethical organization at the time had, had record sales, and you have a toxic culture that lacks ethics and lacks integrity, you will fail. Life has a way of humbling everyone. You know, if you've ever run into that arrogant business leader who's made millions, you know, he, he or she is just a complete horse's ass, treats people with disrespect, give it time. Life is going to find a way to humble that person. So if your organization doesn't follow through on what it preaches, life will have a way of either uh, humbling that organization to where they, they, they change or eliminating them. History is littered with organizations that got complacent, that stopped executing uh, their, their values on a daily basis. When's the last time you bought film from Kodak? Exactly. From the story, you know, I heard the digital camera was actually developed in Kodak. The leadership scoffed. Somebody brought it to another vendor, and now Kodak is a sliver of who they were. BlackBerry, the first smartphone to the uh, smartphone uh, market. They were on top. They stopped innovating and adapting to stay competitive. To, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, Samsung, Apple, all the rest came in and wiped them out. Or how about Blockbuster? 
in the, in the late eighties, nineties, you looked forward to going to blockbuster. That was what you looked forward to on Friday. Yep. There was a blockbuster in every major town. Some towns had multiple block blockbusters. They were a massive brick and mortar retailer store. And they actually had the opportunity to buy Netflix. They said, Hey, our business model is sound. We don't need to innovate and adapt. And where's blockbuster now? And Netflix is what a fortune 500. I don't care how large you are. Even Amazon, if Amazon stops executing in what they hold dear to their success, mm -hmm. Amazon will fail as well. I want to talk a little bit about succession planning. How do organizations, in your observation, typically do succession planning? We're doing some surveys right now uh, of company executives. Here's the bottom line is a lot of them don't do it. And if they do it, it it's a uh, half-ass effort. It's like they're going through the motions, pat themselves on the back of like, hey, we did succession planning, but we have no intent of actually following through on, on, on any change. So a lot of companies don't engage. I mean, I mean, the special operations community is always assessing their talent. In fact, you're ranked. You're ranked amongst your peers. If I'm a lieutenant in the SEALs and I'm at a command with, let's say, 30 other SEAL lieutenants, they're going to tell me where I stand in the organization and what I need to do to get better. So they're like, hey, you rank seven out of 30. In order to get better, you need to do these things. These are your deficiencies. These are your strengths. In the SEAL community, the military as a whole, it's not the special operations community, is always looking at their talent. They're always looking at gaps. Hey, where do we have potential critical points of failure? If we lose this high performer right here, is there somebody that can step up that has the, the level of talent to fill that hole? And so we are obsessive about it. We're giving people evaluations on a quarterly basis. We're letting them know where they, they stand. We're letting them know where we need to improve. If we identify a gap based off our succession planning, we know we need to start training the subordinate leaders below that potential critical point of failure so that they're ready to step up. We always tell our military members, be ready to step up one or two levels. We're always training them for that. So if we see a leader who is not training the subordinate leaders below them, we're going to pull them aside and say, hey, you could be taken off the battlefield at any moment. And if your element fails once you leave, you've actually failed as a leader. So you better start training them to be as good as you, if not better. Succession planning is important and very few companies engage. It's not a hard process. It's if you identify a gap, then you better start being proactive to bring some people into the organization to fill that or to start training people to potentially take that role. Additionally, with succession planning, you, you identify your top performers and you actually start to pour into them more and let them know they're the future of their company. It doesn't mean you don't invest in the rest of the people. You do. And when you invest in your people, you'll start to see a higher level of performance. You don't see the SEAL community fire a senior level officer and say, damn, we need to go out to the private sector and find somebody to replace them. We insource. And insourcing is a lot cheaper when you look at it. That's why the military is the world's greatest leadership development program there is. We understand this. No company can replicate what the military does in terms of leadership development. They have the money to do it. They don't have the domain expertise. MBA programs. MBA programs don't do a great job of producing leaders. They produce business practitioners. Very good business practitioners. But any MBA dean who comes to me and says, we, we actually produce leaders, I will go right up to them nose to nose and say, don't even go there. Don't even say that. We don't produce leaders in two years in the military. It is a year over year process to produce somebody to take command of a SEAL squadron or a Green Beret or a special forces group. That is decades of training and leadership development. George and I are going to write a second book. And quite frankly, there's going to be two other members that write this book with us. It's going to be the talent management and leadership development piece. The Talent Wars, how to design a world-class talent acquisition process. And we touch on, hey, now that you've got a great hire in uh, into the organization, now the real work sort of begins. If you have an all-star hire, you're like, this person is an absolute rock star. And you say, hey, just step into your job. You're not going to get any training and mentorship or coaching. That hire is going to sour real quick. I want to get into a concept uh, of the book that you talked about here. You mentioned it earlier, and it's counterintuitive. Hire for character, train for skill. And I actually want to read a quote from the book, if you don't mind. A person's character is the aggregate of their deeply ingrained attributes. As we define it, the nine foundational character attributes of high potential individuals are drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, effective intelligence, team ability, curiosity, and emotional strength. These traits are predictors of high performance. These attributes cannot be taught, so they should be the focus of your hiring. What an incredible statement that is. 
And again, counterintuitive, right? Because what does industry do? They do the opposite. They're hiring for skill and character. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that it's an, as an intentional thing that they look for. So I want to ask about a couple of these things. What does effective intelligence look like to you? I love this one. And the credit goes to MARSOC, the Marine Special Operations Community. This was actually one of their core attributes that they look for. And first off, the, name, the, the title of the book is The Talent War, how special operations and great organizations win on talent. So the military doesn't have a, have a, a, a patent on this. There are great business organizations out there that, man, I, I, I wish I could go do a deep one-year study on. Business leaders that understand this, Herb Kelleher, founder of Southwest, it's in the book. He said, you know, we hire for attitude and mindset. We can train somebody to the skills of the job. You can train skill. You can level up people on skill. You can't teach character. You technically can, but that, that takes decades and you don't have the, the, the time to do that. Special operations community doesn't have time to... To say, hey, this person is an amazing runner. They're most, they're the strongest, the fastest runner, the strong, the, fa- the fastest swimmer, best pistol shot. But they, they're, they're totally unethical. Let's let them into the organization. We can teach them that piece. No, we, we don't have the time. Any organization doesn't have the time to do that. But great businesses understand this. There's a lot of great business leaders. Effective intelligence. All the interviews we did, both uh, of high level leaders in the special operations communities and high level leaders in the business world, all said intellectual horsepower matters. It does. But believe it or not, if you study each of the roles and you look at all the players filling that role, you're going to find out what the necessary level of intelligence is. What data has shown is beyond that level of intelligence, increasing uh, uh, intelligence scores don't necessarily equate to higher performance. So the special operations studied special operators and said, okay, here's the level of intelligence that somebody needs to be above. And then they designed a test, a personal assessment to test for that. So we do, again, we're a talent magnet. We draw people from the Ivy League schools. We've drawn some wicked, smart people into our community. And they'll make it through the training. But what we found is that somebody who's got that 130 score or in that, that, that general range could tend to be suffer from paralysis through analysis. And they don't have the ability to assess the information given to them, identify a timely solution, and then execute upon it. So We don't care how smart you are. We want to see how effectively you can use your intelligence. And and to sort of summarize this is what we're looking for is the ability of somebody to apply their intelligence to a real world problem for which a book solution doesn't exist in a timely and effective manner. So you've got a guy from Harvard that can come up with a complex solution to a complex problem or a guy from Ohio State. uh, And and now I'm sort of saying that the Ohio State education is not as... uh, as high level as Harvard, and I'm not implying that, but a kid from Ohio State with a 3.0 that has this ability to say, hey, here's, the, here's what I know. Here's the circumstances or the variables that I'm dealing with. Here's a potential solution that goes out and executes in a timely manner. And, and that's, that's what effective intelligence is. What about emotional strength? What does that look like to you? Emotional strength is simply this, is that somebody has the ability to control their emotion. I'll tell you what does not serve you well in a chaotic situation is that's when you get all paranoid and, and you get all emotional. That, that problem's not going to get solved. When rounds are being fired at us, when explosions are going off, if somebody starts to become emotional, that means they're not logical. It means they don't have the ability to emotionally detach and say, okay, what problems am I facing? Let's prioritize those problems. Let's rack and stack them. Let's solve the the worst problem first and move on to the next and the next in a logical manner until we've solved all these problems and we won. Same with the business example. When COVID was at its height, when there was a total lack of information, some leaders got emotional and they'd say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what decisions to make. But a leader with emotional strength said, hey, I have this bit of information right now. I don't know what the right answer is. But hey, guys, men and women, we're going to start moving in this direction over here. We're going to start moving to the left based off the information I understand. I don't know if it's the right decision, but we're going to start moving in a logical manner. And we may get new information tomorrow that says, hey, hey, ladies and gents, you know what? We went left. That wasn't the right direction. Based off new information that we we received in a a logical, unemotional manner, hey guys, we need to start moving right. You guys understand? You all know the direction we're heading and and you start orientating your people in that direction and and start motivating them to, to execute. Think about it also in the context of dealing with people in a business setting. If you and I, Mark, disagree on a potential solution to a problem that we're facing 
and I am so emotionally attached to my solution. And I, I disagree with your solution and I get all emotional and I say, your idea sucks. And, and, and then you start getting heated. Guess what's going to get solved? Nothing. But if I have the ability to emotionally detach and say, Hey, listen to Mark and let's listen to why he thinks his solution is the best. And then ultimately, if I have control over my ego and say, hey, you know what? Mark and I have, you know, his plan is like the 85% solution. Mine's like the 90% solution. They're both going to achieve victory. What does, what is my plan that that 5% advantage really, it doesn't really matter. You know what? Let me check my ego. Let me look at Mark in a logical manner and say, hey, Mark, let's go with your idea. That demonstrates emotional strength when you can control your emotions in a chaotic situation, when you can check your ego so that the, 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 the organization wins. And trust me, we, we let people into the community, the special operations community that have the inability to control their emotions. It shows in their performance. In fact, without getting into detail, there's another level within special operations where people have to try out. It's a very small percentage from a very elite pool make it to this next level. And then this, this process is a nine month another nine month assessment selection process. And they actually put heart rate monitors on people during those nine months wow. to observe their ability to regulate their heartbeat. Because as they get emotional, the heartbeat ranges, they, they, they start to get chaotic. And if somebody who can't regulate that and demonstrate emotional strength uh, will quickly get dropped from the training. Even if they're performing, they won't be able to maintain that level for long. And in the long run, we know they, they won't last long within that, that community. So we remove them from the, uh, the training. So another quote from the book and, and some questions. If you approach your interviews a little more like SOF murder boards. Special operations forces. Yes. Sir. Thank you. You can reveal valuable information. To that end, we have five tips. Know what you're looking for with each question. Create a core set of questions to be used with each candidate. Ask scenario-based and behavioral questions. Add challenges push candidates outside their comfort zone. So first, um, what are murder boards and, and what could they look like in a non-military organization? So we call them murder boards in the military. That sounds awful. So what that looks like is if I'm trying to make it into or a higher level uh, community, or let's say I'm trying to make the next rank, I'm trying to move from lieutenant to lieutenant commander. Sometimes they have these things called murder boards. And what it'll be is senior ranking officers and senior ranking enlisted in like a half semicircle, like let's say seven of them. I walk into the room, they are stone faced and they will just throw these scenarios at you and their behavioral scenarios mm -hmm. or questions. And it's pretty, I mean, they apply the pressure. And if you start heading in a direction, they'll make you think that's the wrong direction. And you'll see people start to, to question themselves. We do that often. It's a good way. I and mean, at, at the end, we debrief people. We debrief them and say, hey, listen, you did a decent job. Let's talk about a, a few things, uh, behaviors you demonstrated, which may not serve you well in the future. And we help the people learn from them. So uh, oftentimes on these burner board, you know the people, but it, it's a very intense situ scenario. Yeah. Is that going to be replicated in the, in the private sector? No. So here's the bottom line, Mark. You have to know what you're looking for. It's those talent profiles. Then you have to design a process that's repeatable, a systematic repeatable process that identifies those attributes that the things you're looking for within those talent profiles. Do you want to apply the pressure in, the, in, in those scenarios? Yes, it goes back to one's true character doesn't emerge until you push people outside their mental and physical limits. Can you push people outside their physical limits in the private sector? No. You're going to end up in a litigious situation. Don't take your job candidates down to Lake Superior and put them in Lake Superior uh, in, in the dead of winter. You're, you're going to end up getting sued. Companies don't get creative with their process. So there are behavioral interviews, there's informational interviews, and that's great. But you have to have other things within the process. A lot of companies don't partake in role play. Role play is one of the most valuable scenarios. So let's say you're a construction company and you're, you're hiring a young construction engineer, construction science major who's 23 or 22 years old. And they're going to be in charge of, uh, of some 40 year olds, some foremen that have been in the industry for 20 years. You may want to see how they work with somebody with, with a vast amount of experience. And mm -hmm. so does this person have the ability to listen to somebody with a vast amount of experience or do they have the ability to listen and then disagree with that person and ultimately make a command decision that says, hey, foreman, I've heard you out. You have a vast amount of experience, much more than me, but we're going to go in my direction. So you could set up role play so that you maybe have the grumpy old 
foreman where the 23 year old has to go speak to that foreman and get him to go along with the direction that they want to head. And so you're identifying behaviors in that, pro- that, that process. The problem with companies is that they may have three interviews for a position and each of those three interviews are not mutually supporting whatsoever. People just ask whatever questions they want to ask and they're not assessing for those attributes. If you and I are going to interview somebody, we need to make sure that even though you're going to ask a different set of questions, that they're going to try to elicit the behaviors we need for that role. And companies aren't aligned like that. You may ask and you may be judging the person based off likability. Well, I really like this candidate. I don't know. I'd love to have a beer with him. Likability is one of the the least important things in, in the interview process. And a lot of people hire for likability because they tie that to culture fit. Oh, I really like that person. They're going to be a good culture. They're going to be a good fit in our culture. No, culture has nothing to do with likability. Culture has everything to do with, does this person share the same values and demonstrate the same behaviors as our culture does or our culture expects? I don't care if I'm going to go hang out with this person during the weekend. People often throw the, uh, the, the family. We're trying to create a family here at uh, Acme Company. No, you're not. You're trying to, uh, to hire a high-performing team. You have a family. I have a family. If we're a high-performing team that hangs out on the weekends, great. That's, that's a bonus. But at the end of the day, if Mark and I don't come together, you know, don't join each other on the weekends, but we come in uh, on Monday, we knuckle bump and say, hey, what's the challenge for the week? What do, what do you and I need to, 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 to do to direct our, our respective teams so that we both win, that this organization wins? That's what you're looking for. So co- people have wildly killed uh, what culture fit truly is. And, and so the, you know, you've got to look when you're hiring and, and you bring that word culture fit in that you're using it in the correct meaning. What's the action that you're hoping readers will take after reading your book? So George and I kept this simple. Your outcomes need to be simple. Is that this small to mid-sized business, a group of these leaders read this book and said, hey, we need to sit down with our HR director or our CHRO. And we need to have a serious talk with talent. And we need to look in the mirror and, and ask ourselves, do we truly have a talent mindset? And are we setting up systems, procedures, and are we backing up our, our, our belief that we do have a talent mindset with actions? Are we taking the right steps to get the right people into the right positions? And then are we developing those people to be the future leaders of this company? And if most organizations look in the mirror, the answer is no. Trust me, with EF Overwatch, we've got to practice what we preach. We wrote this book. Can George and I say, hey, one, we do have a talent mindset. We, we truly believe that. But are we following through on it? And the answer is no, because we have a high, very high bar for ourselves. We say no. We say no because we can do it better. And George and I understand that this thing called the talent war never ends. It's never, we've arrived, we've won the talent war, we're good, we just need to continue in this direction. No, this war can't be won. And that sucks. People don't want to engage in a war that can't be won. That's a normal human reaction. But in the business world, you've got to commit to fighting it every single day. Because if you do commit, then your organization will stick around. But if you're like Blockbuster, or Kodak, or BlackBerry, you stop fighting the war, you will be in the, uh, the, the pages of history. So I want to back up from, from, the, from the book and actually just ask you some general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? I've been surrounded by some of the most amazing, and I tear up as I say it, men and women who were more talented than I was. And often I ask my question, not publicly, but why the hell do I deserve to be around these individuals? Mark, ultimately, when you, are, you create an organization of rock stars, iron sharpens iron. I want to be surrounded by amazing people. What's the quote? You know, if you surround yourself with five people that are more intelligent than you, you're the sixth. You're the, yeah. If you surround yourself with, with five millionaires, you'll become the sixth. If you surround yourself with five idiots, you'll become the sixth. Good people, I'm going to tell you, an organization that believes in hiring rock stars at every level will not put up with B and C players. They will let that person go and they'll go find another A player to fill that role. And so the secret of my success has really been the, the quality of the people that I surround myself. Was I in charge of 40 amazing SEALs? Yes. Do I feel like I deserved it? No. Did my team win? Absolutely. And it wasn't because of me. It was because of them. Hopefully I helped direct them or made a cohesive direction for them to, to head in, but they did the work and I'm just the beneficiary of their hard work. What's the greatest lesson that you've ever learned either in life or in business? 
you don't have everything figured out and that's okay. You're never the smartest man or woman in the room. You know, early on in my SEAL career, I had the fortune and pleasure, and I know this sounds weird, of, of ending up in a very bad battle in Iraq. Guys, that, that's what we do for a living. That's where evil was. That's where I want to be. If, you know, we, we had a, a motto of run to the sound of gunfire. Actually run towards the gunfire. And we did. And we ended up in a position where we could affect good. And because we had become successful so many times in a row, mission after mission, we were bringing the fight to the enemy. We were eliminating enemy combatants. We were eliminating evil and we were winning. And I started to get complacent. And like I said, life has a way of humbling you. Yeah. And on our very last mission of that battle in 2006, I had become arrogant. One of my younger, the most junior SEAL uh, ended up taking action to save the lives of the rest of us. And he lost his life. He was awarded the medal of honor for his action. Wow. Uh, that humbled me and helped me realize moving forward in my life that I don't have all the answers. And guys, because your title is CEO or executive VP or general manager or division manager, it's okay to step in front of your people and say, hey guys, here's the circumstances we're facing. This is the information I have. I don't know what, what the right decision is. What do you guys think? And that's very hard for a lot of leaders to do. And I, I want to tell leaders, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Trust me, we've got 10 people underneath you. That's called a brain trust. They can solve any problem quicker and better than you can on your own. And when you, you can embrace that, you're going to be in a better position to lead. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Smile. Smile. Life is a process. It, it, it is a mystery to be lived, as my dad used to say, not a puzzle to be solved. Yes, you want to take action to achieve things, but life is going to knock you down. Failure is part of the process. Get up, smile, learn from it, and just keep driving forward, guys. At the end of the day, Mark, we all want to live a life of impact. That's my biggest fear, is yeah. I keep looking in the mirror and saying, am I impacting the others around me? Am I benefiting, you know, injecting good into the world? Mm -hmm. Smile. Don't take yourself so seriously. Um, and just enjoy the process, guys. Had I understood that is at a younger age, I would have reflected a lot more and taken a lot more uh, lessons learned going forward, but, but I didn't. Well, I can safely say that you are living a life of impact, uh, both in the past and, and now in the present. And I can see that happening for you in the future. Where can people find you and your book and, and, and find George? And where can they find you and connect with you online? So the book can be found, The Talent War, How Special Operations and Great Organizations Win on Talent, anywhere books are sold. And you know, I know, like we're told to say that because anywhere books are sold, but let's be honest, everyone goes to Amazon. Good on Amazon. So our, the name of our company is EF Overwatch. It is a, a so EFOverwatch.com. It is an executive search firm as well as a talent in HR consulting firm. Our talent in HR consulting firm is top notch. These are people that have run 100,000 personal organizations. George himself has been involved in over 80,000 hires from the C suite down to lower levels. He's designed these programs. What we can do for companies is, yes, we can go find you select leaders on the executive search side. But if we come in with our team, we will help you design a world-class hiring process and retention process, which, trust me, will bring more ROI to your organization than you can imagine. And will keep you guys relevant and above your, uh, your competition. That's what we truly love doing. Plus, while we're doing that, we get to build relationships with our clients because we're in-house for a matter of weeks, if not months. Mike, it's been an incredible honor to have you on the podcast today. It's just been amazing. What a pleasure uh, it's been to, to meet with you, talk with you, and, and get to know you and, and your work a little bit more. Um, I hope we get to do it again soon. <laughs> Next time I'll be shaved and I'll have my sports coat on. I'll look uh, executive. <laughs> You're perfect. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. These podcasts, they, they provide information whether people want to take some of the information or not, but, but you, you're, you're putting valuable content out there. Um, and thank you for that. Hopefully, uh, you know, we, we provided impact to some small to mid-sized business leaders today. Absolutely. Mike, thank you so much.